Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on day two of a relatively long conference, <laughs> or short, depending upon how you look at it. My name is Lisa Bushman, and I'm a cybersecurity specialist with Oracle. And my primary role is to support the state of California from an Oracle perspective um, in all areas with, that have to do with data security, so access, um, and then securing the actual data itself. And I'm very excited to um, be able to participate in um, the introduction of our two speakers today who are gonna do a, a fantastic job of covering everything in the 45 minutes or now 43 minutes that they have to, to talk with you all. I did wanna do a very, very special thank you to Mythics, which is one of Oracle's uh, premier partners and Ryan Williams, who is our, our fearless leader out here in the West from Mythics, uh, for co-sponsoring with Oracle and really being just overall a fantastic partner um, to Oracle in general. So I'm here local. We've got another Oracle guy who's um, right there, uh, Ryan. Ryan. <laughs> Tony Kavoda. Tony, you want to raise your hand? So if you have any questions uh, afterwards of the Oracle folks, we're here and, and happy to, uh, to talk with you. But without any further ado, I want to introduce Venkat, um, who I'm going to let tell his, uh, his pedigree and his bio and his resume because it's quite impressive. And um, uh, Venkat comes right to us from Mythic. So he's going to do the first part of the presentation. And then Eric Harold from Fiscal, who's the Chief Information Security Officer, is going to do the second part of the presentation. I think you're going to find that um, the two topics that they're covering uh, fit together quite nicely. So I hope it's very informative and I encourage you to ask a lot of questions and participate with them. So, thank you. My name is Ben Cat. Uh, I come to you from Virginia. Uh, so most of my work is around the, uh, the, the federal government space. Uh, I support the Department of Defense, most of the civilian organizations, uh, most of the agencies that don't want to be named. And my, my primary role there is to, is to look at system security, uh, both on the application and, and the data layer. So as a, as a penetration tester, as a security tester, uh, my end goal is to get data, and, and that's essentially what I do. So uh, I'm gonna, I'll talk to you about a few strategies. I'll talk to you about what the cyberspace means, because you've heard multiple definitions of cyberspace, and, and cyber means multiple things to multiple people, and I wanna break that down. Uh, I also want to talk to you about a few of the legalities uh, in the cyberspace and the confusion uh, that exists in the cyberspace, just not within the government uh, and the state and local level, uh, but at nation state level, because uh, laws don't apply there. Uh, people don't follow rules, and I want to break that down. And once that's done, I want to talk to you about malware, uh, my primary tool to attack systems to actually get data. Uh, I want to show you a few examples. And uh, uh, we're going to hack the system live. So if you're around, if you've got a mobile phone, you can follow along. Uh, but that's, uh, once that's done, uh, Eric's going to talk to you about the preventive measures, because my, my role is a destructive, is to break systems. So this, the, the cyberspace uh, means multiple things to multiple people. Uh, so f to me, it's, it's, a, it's a combination of three specific things. It's people, it's process, and it's, it's technology. So you put all that together, that forms the cyberspace, uh, which could exist in forms of Internet of Things as a, as a little device that controls temperature in your homes, or it could be uh, terabyte-sized database systems, uh, which is fronted by applications, uh, which is open to the Internet. And we look a few of those uh, misconfigurations today as well. So just, just, to, just a little warning, uh, uh, the examples I'm going to be pulling up uh, I haven't seen them before. Uh, it's going to be live, so if it is offensive, I'll try to change my screens as soon as possible. Uh, and again, any, uh, any examples that you see there is for educational purposes only. Uh, it is not to be taken uh, as a vulnerability of the specific organization to attack them. So, so what organizations do? So we, we spoke about the cyberspace. It is predominantly technology. Uh, so this technology 
uh, that, that is used by people uh, typically have IP addresses. So IP addresses is how we identify machines connected to the internet or other networks. Uh, that helps anybody connected to the internet to actually connect to them. So uh, if you look at IPv4, uh, which actually assigns IPv IP addresses, it's essentially uh, an ask model, right? Machines go join a domain and they say, give me an IP address, they get one. IPv6 on the other end is, is a push model. You can have as many IP addresses uh, that you can send. So one of the misconfigurations there is with routers. So if there is a repeater router, uh, essentially you can do a denial of service attack to get in. So these all constitute the Internet of Things problem, and, and I know this is long-winded, but I'll get to why uh, I'm, I'm setting a baseline as far as IP addresses go. The economy and convenience is something that, that's driven technology, and the Internet of Things and the problems that we see today. So if you, if you look at uh, Uber, for example, largest taxi company, they own no taxis. Right? It's, it's, it's all, they own no cabs. Uh, if you look at Airbnb, uh, the largest uh, uh, room provider in the world, they own no inventory. Uh, same thing with uh, uh, you know, Amazon's got certain inventory, but not, not everything. So that, that is a problem uh, that, that we've created for ourselves because of the convenience of, of using technology, but that opens up a, a very large vulnerability uh, that, that we got to face. The interconnectivity uh, specifically leads to uh, issues both with geopolitics and acceptable use. So what is acceptable use? So I'll show you a few webcams that's open to the internet. Uh, and, and these are open because it's been misconfigured, it's got default passwords, and we'll actually look through a few today. Uh, is, is looking through them acceptable use? Uh, I don't know. Uh, is, if, if a, if a Database system is open to the internet, is looking through them acceptable use, we don't know yet. So where is that line uh, that, that you cross and when you break the law is, is unknown at this point. And that's being defined, it's being debated uh, in, in multiple parts of the world. Second thing is geopolitics. So walking into, or coming into the United States from another country typically requires some type of paper. Uh, you know, be it a visa, uh, you check to the border, uh, before you're let into the country, and you're allowed to stay for a certain period of time, um, depending on your visa length, if you're not a U.S. national or a U.S. person. In the cyberspace, uh, you can get in without a visa. Uh, you can stay as long as you want in United States systems. Uh, you can stay dormant. You can traverse laterally within the network, and you can take whatever you want. Uh, there is no question asked. And in this, we've seen as nation-state attacks. Uh, we've seen this uh, as, as attacks from... Uh, other, other actors that, that sit within the dark web, uh, the deep web, uh, within Tor routers. So this is a, this is a big problem. The last thing I want to talk about is the ideology uh, through which people connect. So the ideology is, is about their interest or their support for certain things. So if you look at groups like Anonymous or uh, WikiLeaks, uh, so they, 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 they get together because of ideology. And, and their end goal is to eventually get to data. It's not description of services. It's not to send malware. It's not to steal identities. The end goal is really to get data. And, and, and we're going to look at why uh, this is a problem with enterprises and why uh, there is not much importance given to that specific domain. Uh, privacy, uh, legal jurisdictions, you know, it again goes back to things with uh, the, the origin of a specific attack, right? They don't, they don't need a visa uh, to get onto your network. They don't need a visa to spin up a thousand instances of commercially available cloud services to launch an attack. And, and the only thing that can stop all this is defensible architecture. Uh, it's, not, it's not, no environment can be fully secure. You'll have to shut down your systems. It's not going to be usable. So that defensible architecture, what I mean by that is, is resilient networks. Uh, networks or systems that can recover from attacks and not lose data, where the confidentiality, integrity, and privacy of specific systems are protected. And we look at a few examples of that as well. Uh, so one of the tools that I use to get into systems, especially for penetration testing, uh, again, when I say that, I've got legal permission to penetrate a system or break into a system, is malware. And, and in the commercial world, malware uh, and the landscape, the threat landscape is changing drastically. Uh, and we see new malware every day. Uh, so here's how it works. When you look at ransomware, everybody knows what ransomware is. So when you look at ransomware, uh, I've seen about six or seven authors 
for ransomware specifically. But the number of people actually pushing out this malware is, is numerous. So what they do is, is they buy malware from, a, from, a, from an author who runs a service, and then they pack it. Or they, they create mutexes. So what that means is they look through the code, and they flip one or two bytes within that code. What that does is changes the signature. So your signature-based detection systems are defenseless once these packages come in, right? They've never seen it before. It's a new signature. And they conduct the same attacks over and over again. So these are nothing more than script kiddies. They run out of an economy where uh, they launch uh, attacks or they do phishing emails uh, to, to use the same uh, weaponized applications over and over again. The, the security posture of the enterprise, uh, you know, when I say it's, it's, it's disconnected, meaning that's the only way uh, you can stay secure. And then the other vulnerability that exists within enterprises is non-production systems. Every, there's a lot of focus for production systems. You know, you've got IDSs, IPSs, firewalls. You've got threat intelligence feeds. You've got uh, incident management solutions. Everything staring at production systems. But non-production systems go, it, it's, it's the easiest way to get in uh, uh, as far as uh, testing goes. And that's typically how uh, uh, bad actors get into a network. Uh, data is not regulated. You know, uh, database developers uh, are allowed to copy production data into non-production environments for test, and that is everybody's practice. That is part of you know, acceptable use. Uh, but again, if you look at things around HIPAA, uh, that is, it is not on a need-to-know basis. People just copy data. Uh, that's, that's a very easy place to drop malware. It's not monitored. Uh, so that's something to look at as to how do you, how do you safeguard non-production environments. Uh, it could be uh, masking data, it could be giving them fictitious data, it could be regulating that, or totally segregating that from your network, right? Let it be a new, new network to do that. So the attack life cycle, when you, when you look at malware, uh, or, any, or any type of attack that comes from a nation state as far as cyberspace and cybersecurity goes, uh, there is a reconnaissance that happens. Right? Someone is staring at you, uh, they're looking at what you're doing, and then they enumerate your network just by fingerprinting what you've got. Once that enumeration is done, uh, they typically send you some kind of a phishing attack or some kind of a package. Could be a USB stick that they dropped around your, uh, your organization, or could be a visitor uh, that came in to, and then plugged in certain devices within your network that you didn't know. So are, the, are your visitors monitored? So that is a level of uh, awareness organizations need. So that, that essentially gives you a payload. Uh, it's downloaded. Uh, then there is infection that happens on your system. Uh, then there's callback. Uh, and then there's lateral movement, and then people leave. So uh, one, of the, one of the organizations that really defined this well was Lockheed Martin uh, and Allidas. It is their cyber kill chain. It's publicly available, and it talks about this model, or what happens in each of these phases, and how do you actually protect it. Now, are you secure? Are you, are you resilient? So there are two things I'm going to do. I'm just going to switch screens. So I've, I've, got, a, I've got a setup here where I've got uh, an attacker and a victim machine. So I'm going to hack into these systems. So what I'm going to do is send a malicious email to the specific actor. Uh, so it's automated and sends an email and I'm done. My victim or a developer or an administrator essentially got an email that said something's up with your Google account. And that's essentially what people do. So when you see that, uh, that, there's a URL that goes around, it goes back, it just closes out, and that's the end of it, right? So they, they delete their email and you're done. So what's happened at the other end is this specific malware package is called SpyNet. Uh, this is my command control server. It's given me full access to this machine because the payload was delivered. That allows me, or any script carry with minimum skills and uh, you needed to browse a Windows machine to actually look through the machine and, and, and collect whatever they want. So this is all point and shoot. There is no shell. There is no uh, skill need. It's, it's that easy. And then how this specific target was done is it's based on, uh, let's pull that up. an open source crawler called Shodan. So Shodan uh, is available for everyone to use. Uh, if you want to run queries, subscription is uh, 
is relatively inexpensive. Uh, so Shodan essentially has crawlers that goes around the internet, uh, collects uh, uh, information, uh, fingerprints, every single device connected to it. So if you, if you want to look for, you know, we spoke about uh, webcams. Uh, if you're looking for web cameras uh, without any password or default passwords, you can find it here. So as an administration tool, uh, I typically run uh, the, the IP ranges I get for customers to see, are you open to the internet? Uh, why is your web application open? Do you have a load balancer? So these are things we look at. So just for, so I'm going to look for databases that's open to the internet. And here is one in Poland. You know, it's a PostgreSQL database uh, uh, that's open, uh, default passwords. And, and uh, let's go back here. There's, there's something from Redis, which is an Amazon uh, memcache D type databases that's open to the internet, default passwords. Uh, so are some uh, the hosting services that have default passwords. Uh, MongoDB here uh, with the default passwords. So that essentially helps you fingerprint uh, what's around to actually get back into a system. So that tells you what is the version. So uh, sites like uh, Common Vulnerability uh, Databases or even MITRE's uh, Vulnerability Database gives you the actual attacks that you can perform against the systems to, to get in. Now, I'm on the consumer side. Uh, I'm going to look for webcams. And these are the webcams that's available. So are you, are you really, really secure? Uh, this is one place to, uh, to, to get in and look. So with that, uh, I'm going to pause and, and get back to uh, Eric. I uh, was going to talk about strategies. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as I said, uh, thank you for the introduction. My name is Eric Carroll. I am the Information Security Officer for the Department of Fiscal in the state of California. Um, <clears throat> uh, Lisa asked me to speak today with you, um, with them about uh, uh, strategies to be able to mitigate uh, some of the attacks or some of the problems that we've seen. And as we've shown today, there's uh, a large problem. We always see the problem. Yeah. Sh sure, no problem. I apologize. Is it? It's working, it's just not picking me up. <clears throat> so as we see, a lot of the problems that we, that we have seen are default passwords. It's things that we should be doing already. Um, so that's part of the, one of the, um, it's things that we should be taking care of if we're implementing proper security controls and have a, uh, any type of effective security program. So that's kind of a theme that I'm gonna be talking about today. So I say watermelons. It's a great summertime snack, but not so good as a, as a security strategy. So how many times as a security professional have you heard the term trusted zone, right? Uh, when, you, when, when you come into an organization, I've seen it time and time again that they, they treat their internal network like it's a trusted zone, that you can do anything you want in there, that security really is an afterthought or it's not really needed there. Uh, and then when you, when you come as a security practitioner to try and implement controls in that trusted zone, the answer you get back is, well, it's internal. We don't need to do encryption. Um, you know, many of the organizations, to our dismay, are too focused on that. We don't need, that we don't need to have those controls in the, in the, inside our trusted zones or in the internal networks. <clears throat> they overlook many of the strategies that we have, and we have been uh, touting time and time again since the beginning of information security, defense in depth. Implement critical security controls, segmentation, encryption, data classification, and awareness and training, right? So many times we have default passwords. We have people clicking on, on uh, uh, phishing emails. We have people putting USB sticks in their machine when they pick it up in the parking lot. Uh, as one of the, the um, uh, presenters at the keynote said, there's no patch for stupid, right? We, just, we, we, we can't protect against that. So we, uh, from a user perspective, so we have to do all we can do internally to prevent that from happening or prevent that from being as effective as it might be. So <clears throat> we need to get away from this watermelon mentality, right? So I say, uh, sadly, organizations are still taking that watermelon approach to security. And uh, I can't take credit for this. I wanted to kind of bring a new security cliche out there. Um, I think, you know, this, this type of uh, 
uh, coinage has been out there since like 2013 when Krebs called it candy bar security, right? Hard on the outside, soft and squishy in the middle. Now watermelons, hard on the outside, soft and yummy in the middle. As soon as the attacker gets in there, it's free reign, right? And that's what we need to get away from. But that's nothing new. We've been fighting this for decades, right? <clears throat> so the impenetrable shell mentality, securing just the perimeter <clears throat> has never been adequate, right? Defense in depth. We've been calling for this since the beginning of information security, but we need to take that defense in depth deeper. Uh, but we need to also change our defense in depth strategies as the threats evolve, as we see more problems, or we see that things, are, uh, things in our program aren't as effective as they probably should be. Today's biggest threats aren't trying to pick the lock on our front door. They're not trying to get through our firewall. They already have the keys, and they look like one of our employees, right? So how do we defend against that? We can be our own worst enemy. 63% of all the breaches in 2015 exploited legitimate credentials, right? And that's from the Verizon report from last year. Over half, right? So over half are either exploiting credentials that have been, ex that have been compromised via some type of, uh, uh, whether it be a phishing campaign or they had a, uh, a device on their network that was able to sniff credentials or they're just not using either strong passwords or, or resetting the default passwords. Security, training, uh, security awareness and training is often too ineffective. And this is shown if anybody has done a security assessment or done a phishing exercise, uh, we still constantly get a 30% hit rate on those emails every single time. It happened to me and it drove me crazy. I had just done security awareness training. I had just sent out emails because we had, we had, we had some phishing attempts at our organization and then we do this exercise and I get a 30% hit rate and then 10% of the people that clicked on the link actually entered their password. Why are you doing this? <clears throat> so you have to remediate those people, give them special training. Uh, as someone said, one of my colleagues said to me earlier today is maybe we make them teach the next class so that they'll, they'll be more aware of what's happening, right? <clears throat> so many of the controls we've relied on focus on preventing threats from the outside. And that's not just us as security professionals, it's IT organizations in general. They're worried about the hacker coming in and they're not worrying about the insider threat, which is our biggest threat vector, right? It's all of our employees. Or uh, too few, too few uh, focus on the use of valid credentials. So if somebody's using a valid credential and it's during normal business hours, how are we gonna defend against that? <clears throat> Firewalls, IPS, antivirus, you know, all of the controls, secure coding standards, access controls, account reviews, no matter what you do, it's not gonna do you any good if your DBA's accounts are, are compromised, right? The DBA has all the keys to the kingdom. And if their account's compromised, game over. Especially if you have a watermelon for your security strategy. Okay. So how do we defend against ourselves? Take that old adage of defense in depth, and we hear that all the time, defense in depth, layered security, onion, all this good stuff. But we have to take that deeper. So <clears throat> what I would say is we go on the assumption that our accounts are already compromised, that it's going to happen, that somebody is going to get an account or get credentials and be able to get into our network. What do you do then? How do you stop that, right? So we want to take that and uh, take that security in depth approach, but start inside out. Start where, your, uh, start where your data is, know where it is, protect your data at the source, know who has access to your sensitive or confidential information, and know how it's accessed. And then in the end, awareness, awareness, awareness. Keep beating that in because more and more people are, get, where the phishing attacks get more and more sophisticated, more and more prevalent, and more people keep clicking on the links. So where to start? As always, we've been talking about this forever. Implement critical, critical security controls. Pick, take your pick, SANS Top 20, NIST, ISO, COVID, whatever uh, regulatory compliance you fall under, make sure you're implementing those controls. Because if you're doing those well at every level of your organization, you've already got most of these things already taken care of. <clears throat> Implement some type of SIM and threat intelligence. That helps tremendously when you're getting that insight into your uh, into what's happening in your environment change default passwords again if you're implementing critical security controls you're doing that but make sure it gets done every time I do a scan I find somebody with a default password somewhere auditing and alerting <clears throat> so tying all this together right uh, with your sim with your auditing and alerting 
alert on, on suspicious activity, establish baselines, and then if there's something that happens that's outside of that norm, look into it. That's why we have security professionals. That's why we have these things. Look into them. Don't just let those alerts go off into cyberspace. Focus on the data. So if we take the approach that our accounts are already compromised, that somebody out there has one of our accounts, or somebody is smart enough to use their application or their uh, work account to register for a website, and that website gets, gets hacked and those accounts get dumped on the internet, it's out there. People reuse passwords all the time. <clears throat> we all know it. Well, we do it sometimes ourselves, right? We use the same password for three or four different you know, Gmail accounts. Our users do it, except they do it worse. So uh, we, if we focus on the data so that we say, if the accounts are already compromised, if the, if the attackers can already get in, let's stop them from getting to what's important to us or limit how they can, what they can get to. So separation of duties on your databases or for your admins, you know, establish separation of duties so that if a DBA's account gets compromised, that they have less, there's less damage they can do. If they don't have access to the data, the DBA account doesn't have access to the data, then they can't, then the DBA account's compromised, they can't get to the data, the attacker, or vice versa. If your backup administrator, <clears throat> you know, if, if they can run the backup, but they can't actually get to the data that they're backing up, then uh, you, you have less of a chance of having a, a breach, so to speak. You still have an incident, you've still been compromised, but at least they didn't get away with your goods. Uh, so, and then consider separating out uh, critical security, you know, administration from activities like DBA, system administrators, and things like that. <clears throat> protect the data. So encrypt the data at rest, right? So we're going to encrypt the data at rest so that we protect our DBA files, the, the database files, uh, so that if someone were to compromise root on a server, they, don't, they can get to the database files, but if they steal them, they're encrypted. So it's not that big of a deal. It's still, it's still an issue, but at least they haven't had direct access to the data. And then also encrypt the data in the database. <coughs> so that if an uh, application account or the DBA account or your security administrator account gets compromised, they might be able to get to it, but they can't actually read the values. Uh, also, ensure proper key management. That goes hand in hand. If you're going to encrypt something, don't store the keys with the database. Don't store them in a clear text file. You know, and use proper key strings. Don't use you know, weak algorithms or weak key strings so that they could be compromised offline. Because the attacker is going to take your data, and then they have all the time in the world to do what they want with it to try and get into it. And then also, lastly, if you're encrypting the data at rest, if you're, if you're securing or separating out who can access what, if you're not encrypting that data or protecting it in transit, it's kind of a moot point, right? So all somebody has to do is do a TCB dump on the DB, on a database server and they got all that data in clear text leaving. So now you've just, you've just ruined all of your security controls. <clears throat> Again, uh, as we continue deeper, right? So one of the things I've noticed is that we try to do a good job with configuration management across the board, but we leave out the databases. We leave out the place where our data is. So we want to make sure we have good configuration management. We want to make sure we know our authorized devices, maintain list of authorized accounts, all these things that we should be doing in our environment, but look at the actual database. Who has access to it? What accounts do they have? Periodically audit that. You know, do you have any public database links in your database? If you do, you really need to look at them because they probably shouldn't be there. Limit connectivity to your database. So again, we're, we're taken from the the aspect that if the DB, if the database administrator account or a service account is compromised, how can they get to that? We need to limit that threat vector, right? <clears throat> so you want to use segmentation. So many times I've gone into organization and it's just a flat network. You know, if you're lucky, maybe you're on different VLANs for your servers and your database servers and app. But a lot of times it's all the same network. So as soon as you get in, you have access to everything. You know, so we want to use IP filters on listeners. If you know you only have two applications connected to a database server, why have that listener open to everything, right? Just limit it down. Limit it where application accounts can connect from. If you have an application account, it's got full access to all the data. Why should that application account be running anywhere except where the application server is? <clears throat> Tight controls on application account credentials. So if you have these application accounts, if a person knows the, the credentials to it, it, you're, it's, it's, it's pretty much just like any other account, and you're never going to be able to know that it's, it's been 
compromised because it just looks like any other application uh, traffic, right? And oftentimes that's anonymous, right? We see this application, this application account doing uh, app, doing uh, queries in the database. It looks like it's normal activity. <clears throat> and then also looking looking at using database proxy solutions. They have several out there in the marketplace, but we're looking at implementing like the Oracle uh, database firewall uh, to control what your database administrators or your admins are doing in the data. So, and then pushing those through kind of a bastion host type of inst instance uh, where we, we're funneling all the controls so we have all of the logging, auditing, alerting in one location. And it's less, um, we have, you know, we have less things, less endpoints to worry about accessing our, our databases. <clears throat> Did I miss one? So if we take the approach that, you know, like I said, someone's account's already compromised, and we look at how, do we, how are we going to protect that? So there are, there are technologies like um, <clears throat> Oracle Database Vault, where you're segmenting off your database, putting the important uh, or the critical aspects or the sensitive data into its own container, and then even removing access to DBAs from that, right? So if the, if the DBA account's compromised, they can get in there, create all the accounts they want, do they can do everything they want to that database, take it down, drop tables, whatever, but they're still not gonna get the data. Also, you can, you can do some things through the, through the application as well. And we're looking at some possible solutions in the future where we can take and protect sensitive data being displayed in, in end applications via database vault. So, so that certain users, not certain end users of the application can get to the data, but certain ones can't. <coughs> So what we want to do is we want to try and prevent access to our, the, what's important to us as much as possible. So we, we limit who can get to the sensitive information and how they can get to it. We implement separation of duties where, where possible. We use encryption, segmentation, alerting and auditing, uh, but there's still no substitute for a robust information security program with critical controls. This is just what I'm, what I'm advocating as we take those and we push it all the way down to where the data lives. If we know where it is, we can protect it. We can protect ourselves from the next breach and limit the impact. So any questions? All right, well, thank you very much.